Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. Today I'll be trying to devise a bypass technique for this magnetic padlock. So let's get into it. So I came across this most recent acquisition while scouring through the vintage locks available on eBay, which is something I seem to be doing more often these days. I'd heard about magnetic locks, but hadn't really got my hands on one, so I jumped at the opportunity, and here it is. It came in its original packaging and was supplied with two keys, which consist of a short bar which is placed against the side of the lock body to affect the open. Now, I had a few ideas about how I might bypass this mechanism based on what I'd come to learn about how these kinds of locks work. While I haven't cut this model open, most magnetic locks consist of a series of pronged pegs which hang above a floating bar with an equal number of holes drilled in specific places along its length. This bar prevents the shackle from being released unless the pegs are aligned with the holes, allowing it to move upwards. And this will only happen when a specific set of magnetic fields comes into play, causing the pegs to move until they hover immediately over each of those specific points. If just one of the magnetic fields is misaligned, the bar and the shackle will remain in the locked position. The lock itself has no magnetic components, and so without access to the key, this is quite a challenging proposition. I've seen Bosnian Bill and others succeed in a kind of magnetic raking operation by sliding a magnet up and down the keyway whilst pulsing the shackle, but I've not been able to make that work on this particular lock. I'm also aware that it's possible to repurpose a specialist drill bit used for tightening and opening hidden threaded joints within furniture to produce a similar effect. The Lamello Minimag MX2 consists of a series of magnets which spin within a fixed perspex box, and when held against the lock body, it produces a magnetic storm of sorts. You can think of it as the equivalent of using an electric pick on a pin tumbler lock. And I'd love to have a go with this tool, but at almost £100, I can't really justify that kind of expenditure for a lock type which I'm unlikely to come across too often. So instead, I decided to begin with a simpler approach. I got hold of a square of magnetic paper and held the key against it to reveal the specific magnetic fields involved, and it became clear that this lock opens in response to four magnets in this specific configuration. Armed with this knowledge, I got hold of a set of small magnets in order to try and replicate the field effects at play. Now, of course, each of these magnets could be configured with either pole facing upwards, and if I had come across this lock in the field and only had access to the key for long enough to swipe it with the magnetic paper, I'd have to use trial and error to determine the correct polarities for each of the four positions. But in this case, I have ready access to the key whilst I test my theory, so I used one of the magnets to test the polarity of all four positions, discovering that the first three are all aligned with the same pole, whilst the fourth is reversed. What I hadn't accounted for was the fact that the little buggers were far more interested in jumping together than staying where I put them. Even matchstick separators made little difference, and I soon realised I would need to fashion some kind of a frame in which the magnets could sit. And I wanted to come up with something I could use for the future too, rather than just glue the magnets onto a base for this specific lock. And so, with this flexibility in mind, I came up with the following design. The magnetic paper had revealed three magnets aligned in a row, with the last one being offset. It stood to reason then that the manufacturers were likely to use only one of a few possible sets of patterns, offsetting one, two or three of the magnets from the centre line. So if I could cut a set of frames, allowing for each of these combinations, then I could set the magnets into the drilled holes, reversing them or turning them upside down, so that these templates could serve most of the possibilities I might come across for this lock type. So with my frame design sketches in hand, I reached out to Ed Canigan, my colleague in my school's design and technology department, who kindly helped me to open my first six lever lock, which was the focus of last week's episode. So I asked Ed if he could help me laser cut these templates in perspex, and he kindly agreed. 
If you want to do this yourself and don't have access to a laser cutter, you can of course always use offcuts of wood and a regular drill bit instead. So I now had my magnets, a set of key templates, and it was time to test my approach. The good news is that the magnets now behaved themselves and stayed in their respective holes, but unfortunately I couldn't secure the open even when I moved the frame around a little in case there was a slight misalignment. Undeterred, I decided to grind away one of the original keys so I could get a better look at what was going on inside. This took quite a while, and just as the magnets were starting to emerge from the metal that they'd been cast into, I felt a bit of an idiot when the rear of the key popped off instead to reveal a nice line of magnets epoxied in place. I could have just levered this off in the first place. Lesson learned. A closer study of the guts of this key was most revealing. First, I noticed that this plate had a series of seven circular indentations designed presumably to house the magnets, and this configuration wasn't what I expected either, because not all of the spaces were equidistant. Not only this, but the magnets were much smaller than the ones that I had been using. These were three millimetres in diameter rather than five. In retrospect, I realised that I'd taken my measurements from the magnetic fields displayed on the paper, which were of course much larger than the magnets producing those fields. It was likely that the fields from my larger magnets were bleeding into one another, causing unhelpful interference patterns. It was clear then that I would need to get hold of a smaller set of magnets and cut out a new template with this updated configuration instead. So I went back to Ed the next day, who was infinitely patient, and after another hour or so I came away with this new and improved keyframe. I then watched the postbox like a hawk until the Amazon delivery arrived, and with my new smaller magnets I retested the method, and this time I was able to secure the open. So, the approach was sound, but I of course had the advantage of already having access to the key, in effect, I duplicated it rather than bypass the mechanism per se. If I didn't have the key and had to brute force the open instead, what I wondered would be the total number of possible combinations, assuming that the seven embossed circles are the only ones used in this lock and key model. Well, let's think it through. We have seven positions, four of which will house magnets and three will remain vacant. And then each of these magnets could be orientated with the north or the south pole facing upwards. So if I've calculated this correctly, there are 34 possible arrangements of the four magnets, which are as follows. And feel free to pause the video if you want to see if I've missed any. Believe me, this took quite some time. And then for each of these, I guess we could have any of the following 16 polarity arrangements. So if we take the 34 magnet configurations and multiply that by the 16 polarity setups, we arrive at 544 possible key combinations. And given the time it takes to switch the magnets in and out of the frame each time, that specialist drill bit suddenly seems like a much more reasonable investment. Because of the way that the shackle is locked in place, this model isn't shimmable, and I haven't found another way of securing a non-destructive open, so what looks like a relatively simple mechanism is actually surprisingly secure. With no access to the pegs through an open keyway, it can't be picked, combed or bumped, and so I've ended up with an unexpected degree of respect for this kind of security design. Now, if you have any alternative suggestions for how I might attack this lock without damaging it, then do let me know in the comments. Since starting this project, I've now acquired another couple of magnetic locks made by different manufacturers and with different mechanisms involved in at least one of them. So it'll be interesting to see how they compare to this one. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and until next time, take good care.